Good evening. Welcome to Orthodox Christian Theology. It's Craig Trulia, and this is a show I felt that had to be done because I saw apologetics gone wild, and it has to do with Pope Honorius and the monothelite controversy and the sort of polemical tact that's taken from a popular uh, Roman Catholic apologist, Eric Yabara. Now, I want to discuss this issue without lots of theatrics or personal animosity, the things that, the unedifying things that come up in the apologetics. So I'm just going to get right to the point, which is you, the viewer, have to do your homework and not trust any talking head on the internet, let alone, you know, even scholars and whatnot. You know, people want to trust one person, but they don't interact with the sources. And so there's nothing wrong if you're a normal person, you just read your prayers, you repent, you give alms, you go to church and you're faithful. But if you actually want to study these topics of the scriptures and church history in a serious matter, you can't approach this like it's sports, right? Like my local team is Syracuse University and the Buffalo Bills. And so like whether the team is horrible, whether they're any good, you always cheer for them. But you could like them, but you can't always think, well, because... I like Syracuse Orange, they always win. Or Syracuse Orange always has the best team on the field. I mean, that would be taking your being a fan of something and just taking it too far. And so this happens in apologetics. It becomes WWE and people take the, this is their guy, their fighter, and whatever that guy says is right. And all I can say is, you're going to see some wild stuff today and it's not even look down upon the person. Look down upon yourself if you're not doing the homework. And so that's kind of like the moral of the story I'm going to say from the beginning. Always do your homework when uh, researching apologetics. And don't trust any person you want to look at the sources because we're going to see people that are even trusted, they get stuff very, very wrong. And it doesn't make them bad people, but they can still get stuff very, very wrong, even heretically so. And so with that said, we're going to share video and start talking about uh, this video that uh, Eric Barr has done on the monothelite controversy in Pope Honorius. And the whole polemical point is, well, this doesn't invalidate papal infallibility. And so for this, 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 that reason, that takes two hours to talk about. And so Eric Barr starts by giving what... He attempts, I believe, not accurately, but he at least attempts to give be very even-handed. He says the sixth, the seventh, even the eighth, so to say, ecumenical councils call Pope Honorius a heretic. And then he says, well, even though they all call him a heretic, here's why we don't think this is a big deal, right? So that's the whole point of his video. But as he builds his case in his attempt to be charitable, to be even-handed, he says things that are, are egregiously erroneous. And so... My hope would be that he'd be grateful because what I'm going to point out here could save his soul. And this is actually very relevant. This is not to be WWE. This is very relevant to the actual point he's making and trying to draw from Pope Honorius. So stay tuned. So we have uh, the video there. We're going to play first um, the actual letter from Pope Honorius. And we're going to see how heretical it really is and why it's heretical. So without further ado... Let's read Pope Honorius' heretical section, his letter to the Bishop of Constantinople. Let's go. On this topic. Uh, so I'll open up. Quote, of course, the Godhead could neither be crucified nor have the experience of human suffering. But through the ineffable conjunction of the human and divine nature, one can consequently make both statements that God is said to suffer and that the humanity came down from heaven with the Godhead. It follows, too, that we confess one will of the Lord Jesus Christ, since manifestly our nature was assumed by the Godhead, there being no sin in it. The nature, of course, created before sin, not the one that was corrupted after the transgression of Adam. For Christ the Lord, who came in the likeness of sinful flesh, removed sin from the world, and from his fullness all of us have received. Taking the form of a servant, he was found in the likeness of a human being. All right, so that is the text 
Um, that All right, so we have the text there. We have what Pope Honorius wrote. This would create centuries of controversy. This is the letter in which Eric Ibarra in his video will uh, discuss at length in order to try to say this is not an issue. Now, let me just tell you from the outset, what did we just hear? What's the point of the letter? Well, what Pope Honorius was trying to do was take this conciliatory approach between monothelitism and diathelitism. And this conciliatory approach was rejected just a few years later by St. Pope Martin's partisans, okay? And so what we see here is this kind of vague statement that Christ has one will because he assumed into the Godhead the human nature that precedes the fall. And that's really the statement he makes. And so one would infer from that, okay, so he assumed a sinless human will because before the fall, the human will was not sinful. This is a very important anthropological point, which we're going to see is going to be very relevant and is missed a lot, especially in more modern treatments, Roman Catholic, um, Western-oriented Orthodox people that understand the patristic anthropology of the church, which the Sixth Council is all about. And so he makes this statement, but he's not very clear. Yes, he assumed to the Godhead this prelapsarian human nature, but he says just one will. So does that mean he assumed that human nature and then that is just one will with the divine nature? And there's not two wills, a human and a divine nature, right? Pope Honorius is not specific. And I think on purpose, because he was trying to be the 7th century version of an ecumenist. He's trying to say, you guys in Alexandria, in Constantinople, us guys in Rome, we're all saying the same thing, just using different words. And those partisans of St. Pope Martin actually uh, call this uh, a epithet three wills. <laughs> they, uh, you could read this in 7th century Popes and Martyrs, page 299. It's a translation of the first hagiography of St. Pope Martin. And they criticize the three willers. And it's not because anyone literally taught three wills. They're criticizing this approach that Honorius had, that you're saying one wills and two wills is the same thing. Well, what I just said is above everyone's heads because no one's really reading this stuff. Um, it's something that scholars will say, if you read the minutes, uh, the introduction of the minutes of Lateran 649, they say the monothelites, the diatholites, they're saying the same thing using different words. Well, obviously Pope Honorius probably believed that. So why did St. Maximus and others not believe that? Why did they take such efforts to try to reinvent what Honorius said? Why is Eric Ybarra going to do the same thing? All right, and we're going to see why this ecumenist approach, again, crypt, you know, uh, proto-ecumenist in the seventh century from Pope Honorius is heretical. Because you're gonna see the actual interpretation of it, which Eric accurately gives, is heretical. So this is what Eric says in the defense of Pope Honorius and in trying to explain those words in an orthodox sense. What you're gonna see is not actually orthodox. So I'm going to, Screen's still there. We're going to play it. So let's go. The divine and human natures. Rather, there's very good evidence here, just by reading the text carefully, that Pope Honorius intends to say that because of the hypostatic union, um, so there's, you know, the one who postasis, which is Jesus Christ, the Lord. Um, because of that unity of the of natures within the hypo, the, hypo, the one apostasies of the Lord, there can said to be a harmony of the will of uh, between every decision that Jesus made, whether it was from whether he was operating from the uh, the uh, human nature uh, when he expressed uh, tiredness, uh, hunger, or uh, he he desired sleep, um, anything that would be appropriate to uh, his human nature. Um, it's the one who postasis who makes the, the decision. Um, and then when the Lord is acting according to the divine nature, like doing miracles, walking on water, things like that, um, he's he's operating from the, the divine nature. But there is no um, there is no uh, division in within the human uh, within the one who postasis by a human uh, division of wills that is that that comes about from having a sin 
nature. That's why he emphasizes the absence of, a, of, of original sin in the Lord. Of course, the... the, uh, the All right, so we see what Eric had to say there, and he's trying to explain in an orthodox sense what Pope Honorius is talking about. Now, there's a serious issue. I don't want to be all theatrical, but when Eric Ebers make this argument that there's one hypostatic will, that the hypostasis of Christ operates in a harmony, he says, that there's there can be said to be a harmony, there's one hypostatic will. Well, the problem is that is monothelitism. What Eric Ybarra said in defense of Pope Honorius is actually definitional monothelitism. And so what he just proved is what Pope Honorius actually said was literal monothelitism. I'm going to, I'm going to, again, I'm going to emphasize this again. Hypostatic will, there being one hypostatic will, is monothelitism. Now, I'm going to quote uh, Cambridge Edition of Early Christian Writing, Volume 4, page five, uh, 559. And we're going to see this is what the scholars say. The scholars say, the monothelites at Constantinople III, in particular, Macarius of Antioch and his disciple Stephen, affirmed one will in Christ, one hypostatic will, associating will with person, not nature. All right? So they believed and taught one hypostatic will, not two natural wills, but one hypostatic will being that harmony that Eric was talking about. Now, why is this heretical? The monothelites of Constantinople III appear to have been particularly worried about the human will implying sinfulness so that they excluded from Christ, preferring to affirm instead that one divine will of Christ has accomplished through his humanity. We see that in pages 559 to 560. So they were worried that the, the monothelites being like what we saw Papa Noria, uh, Pope Honoria say, that unless we speak of one hypostatic will, this would imply Christ having a human will that's sinful. All right? And I'm going to just play again what Eric said, because I want you to understand that what he just literally defended from Pope Honorius' textbook, Monothelitism. So we're going to go again. Because of the hypostatic union, um, so there's, you know, the one hypostasis, which is Jesus Christ, the Lord. Um, because of that unity of the of natures within the hypo, the, hypo, the one hypostasis of the Lord, there can said to be a harmony of the will of between every decision that Jesus made, whether it was from whether he was operating from the uh, the uh, human nature uh, when he expressed uh, tiredness, uh, hunger, or uh, he he desired sleep, um, anything that would be appropriate to uh, his human nature, um, it's the one who postasis who makes the the decision. Uh, and there and there we have it. Right, the one hypostasis that makes a decision, and then when the Lord is acting according to the divine nature, like doing miracles, walking on water, things like that, um, he's he's operating from the the divine nature. But there is no um, there is no uh, division. In All right, so we see him literally give the textbook a monothelite definition. Now you can well maybe the scholars are wrong, so I'm going to quote. Uh, in session one of Constable three, Macarius of Antioch himself. And he speaks as follows. And in session one, oh man, did I forget the page number? I think it's page 601 in the same book. So if I remember right, people want to look it up. Uh, I'll, I'll put the, uh, the actual thing later. But anyway, in session one of the council, Macarius says, in regard to this issue, we have already expounded a confession of faith previously, and we are in agreement with the five holy synods, as well as the divine-minded Honorius, Sergius, Paul, and Peter, and the rest of whose memory we invoke to the testimonies we delivered to the master, confessing one hypostatic will and our one Lord Jesus Christ and his God-manly activity. All right? So as we could see that... 
they were anthropological heretics that didn't understand that the prelapsarian human will proceeds from human nature, all right? And is by nature inclined to follow the divine will, not oppose it. This, this whole monothelic doctrine, kind of similar to Nestorianism and Miaphysitism, has this kind of view that, well, before the fall, the, um, the human nature is in opposition to the divine will. And so they said, well, when Christ hypostasized and hypostasized uh, human nature, this pretty much healed the human will. So now it always does the divine will. But anthropologically, that's not true. Before the fall, Adam's will always followed the divine will until he was deceived. And Christ being deified did that as a default. That is the actual teaching of Constantinople III. And so page 613, same book, we're going to read in the Decree of the Council, session uh, 18. All right, it says, likewise, we also proclaim, this is the council speaking, not a heretic, two natural wills, right? Not one hypostatic will, two natural wills that are not in opposition as the impious heretics claim. Absolutely not. Instead, we proclaim that his human will follows his divine and all-powerful will without resistance or contention, but rather in subjection to it. For in this way, his all-holy blameless flesh endowed with soul was not destroyed when it was deified, but remained in its own limit and definition. I'm going to emphasize that. Remained in its own limit and definition, because by definition, that's what human nature does, right? That's the anthropology that diatheletism presumes upon. And that's what's lacking in, um, in monotheletism. And that was the kind of the ecumenist thing that uh, Pope Honorius was trying to bridge together, was that one thing. So to continue, so in accordance with this reasoning, we hold that there are two natural wills and activities that come together appropriately for the salvation of humankind. All right, so we can see this is not me just pulling it out of my hat. This is explicitly in the council. And not so coincidentally, Pope Honorius was not teaching what the council taught. In fact, Pope Honorius was teaching what Macarius was teaching. And we saw that from Eric's own admission admission because he was emphasizing hypostatic will, not two natural wills, all right? And just so people wonder, and I was still in metaphysics, um, essence comes from, um, from essence comes energies, and from essence also comes wills, all right? And so each essence has a will. That's how it works. It's not hypostatic. <laughs> That's, that is a uh, error that comes from meophysitism, or more, more accurately, actually, monophysitism. So anyway, that being said, let's continue how Eric talks about this because Eric actually now starts justifying what Anuri says because he buys into, as we just heard, this hypo one hypostatic will. So I'm not saying this to pick on him. This is the problem when people that haven't read the councils or Maximus in detail, they just read what a scholar says about them, don't know the actual points at issue. And the problems with you as the viewer, if you don't read the sources, you just trust what the head tells you. All right. So I am uh, now going to the next clip so you can just see this is exactly what Eric says. Uh, there's very good reasons if you read the whole letter uh, to take Honorius that way. And so to be clear here, what I'm saying is that um, it looks like there's very good internal evidence for uh, Honorius. Uh, being uh, thoroughly orthodox. Yeah. All right. So we, we just saw exactly what was said by Pope Anarius. It was condemned by multiple ecumenical councils, matching what was taught by a condemned person at Council uh, 3, uh, Macarius of Antioch. And we just saw Eric give the, the defense that it's absolutely orthodox. And my hope is, and this is actually very relevant. It's not polemical. It's going to be relevant to his point. My hope is he will have to withdraw this point because if he obstinately continues with this, he will be by his own definition a heretic. And we don't want that. Okay. None of us want that. So we're going to continue and we're going to see how Eric tries to parse what exactly the monothelite position is. And because he doesn't understand it, I think that's why he mistakenly thinks the monothelite position is actually the orthodox position. So uh, let me cue that up for you guys, and I will play that clip.
All right, and let's go. As if Honorius was teaching that there is one will between the natures, between the divine and human natures, such that um, there is no uh, human, authentic, you know, numerically distinct human will coming from the human. All right, so you just saw Eric say, no, Honorius was not teaching that there's one will with the human will and the divine will combined. But that's actually not the monothelite argument, right? That two natural wills were made into one natural will. That's not the monothelite argument at all. We just heard it from the Charis of Antioch. The monothelite argument is two natural wills are one hypostatic will. That is the problem. Not that at all times that there is actually two natural wills by nature, the human will following the divine will because there's no sin, right? That's the actual orthodox doctrine. The monothelite doctrine conflates that under one hypostatic will so that now you can't even speak of two, two actual wills acting um, independently anymore because you're defining will as hypostatic but not as natural, all right? Again, it's kind of a little bit above people. And so you might have to rewind this and just go by the minutes of the council. By all means, watch this yourself. But for those who understand the points at issue, and this is why I was, the only thing I'm published with in theology is this issue. This sticks out to you as egregious, okay? And, and that is problematic because this is something that was condemned to the ecumenical council. And I, I hope that Eric will walk this back um, and withdraw these comments. Now, he speaks about some of the historical defenses for Pope Honorius. And just as a review for the audience, there's been several over centuries for Pope Honorius, and they keep changing. And I think any good historical, the reason the defenses keep changing for Pope Honorius is because none of them are really all that good and defend them that well. All right? <laughs> because if they did, they'd just stick with one of them. But we see there's many of them. Um, it looks like Eric, he, he quotes both Pope John IV and he quotes um, Anastasius the Librarian. So I'm not entirely clear with whose excuse he buys the most, but we'll just go over them and we can evaluate uh, whether they sound any good. So let's just play Eric talk about Pope John IV's letter that happened immediately after Pope Honorius was Pope. And at 15 minutes and 42 seconds, and make sure I'm sharing screen. Here we are. Let's go. Worth saying that Honorius did not mean to say that. Oh, oh the, these apologists and they want the money and they got the advertising. Fall guys, into please. The right friendly place. No ads and the things of God, please. That there was only one will of his divinity and humanity. Rather, there was only one will in with coming from the 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 hypostasis of the Lord in his human nature, no op opposition within the human nature. And that seems to be like I read to you uh, at the beginning. That seems to be what Honorius. All right. So it seems to be what Honorius is saying. Now, I think what Eric says here is closer to the truth, in all honesty, because Pope Honorius, uh, Pope Honorius, Pope John the Fourth and uh, Max Smith, so with a slightly nuanced argument, I think we're trying to re reframe what Pope Honorius was saying, right? So what they're saying is all what Pope Honorius was writing against was there's no conflict between human wills, right? The will of the heart, uh, the, the heart and the will of the flesh, right? Or the will of the mind and the will of the flesh, whatever is in Romans 7. Um, and so if you just take that literally, that would presuppose two human wills, which obviously doesn't exist. So the point of issue, as St. Maximus makes clear in Disputation of Pyrus, is gnomic willing, right? Christ didn't gnomically will. He didn't have this dialectic of oppositions where he was willing God's will one way and then he had concupiscence the other second, right? That that's, was not, there was no conflict within his one will in a, it wasn't a fallen human will. It was a prelapsarian human will without gnomic willing, meaning it freely, it was a free will that always followed the divine will. That's what true freedom is. Not, not knowing what the divine will is and resisting the, the divine will. That's actually slavery, according to Romans 6. 
True freedom is following the divine will, and that's what Christ had because that's the actual natural prelapsarian, unfallen human condition. All right, so John the Fourth is trying to argue. Well, this is what um, this is what uh, Norris is saying, but Maximus actually, uh, I think it's Opusculum thirteen, if I remember right, says, "Well, well, maybe Norris never even really wrote this, right?" Uh, John the Conciliar or the Counselor, I think his name was. He was the uh, the scribe for the Pope, and he and he wrote the wrong thing. Is the excuse. Now, the question is, all right, so we see these different excuses just a couple of years really after Pope Inertius is dead, which shows it's really not that good of an excuse. Now, let's first evaluate John the Fourth's excuse, right? That, all right, well, what Pope Inertius was talking about is that Christ really didn't have a gnomic will. Well, this is weak because it, this would justify another heretic that used the same language, Sergius of Constantinople. So, for example, Sergius presupposed, and I'm going to quote page 596 in the same book I was quoting before. I'm going to quote him. It is impossible for two wills that are contrary to exist at the same time in one subject. Right? So he is also saying, well, we're not talking about two opposing human wills. Right? We can't have two opposing wills. And so if that's all Pope Inouye is saying, then you're now justifying Sergius in the same grounds, which we can't be doing, obviously. These are all condemned heretics. And so I think that's why the tact changed very soon after Honorius' death. And it came to, well, Honorius really didn't write that. You know, this guy named John the Counselor wrote that. And so we're going to get a little more to that in a bit where we evaluate whether that's actually defensible or not. Um, so I think before we get there, I want to take Eric in, uh, in order in this video and my opinion is, it's not that he's setting out to be a heretic. I mean, no one sets out to be a heretic, right? Rather, it's through either ignorance or greed or pride that, or stupidity that someone's a heretic. Like, no one generally says, I'm going to be a heretic on purpose because I want to go to hell, right? And so in this case, I actually don't think Eric is trying to be a heretic because no one is trying to be a heretic. No one has that intent to be a heretic. But what he said beforehand was heretical due to his ignorance. Because we can see as he tries to explain himself, he finally actually says, he speaks of diatheletism in an accurate way later in the video. And I want to I want to play that clip to demonstrate that I honestly don't think that Eric is trying to stake this heretical position. He does so by mistake out of ignorance. So let me play where Eric actually gets it right. Okay, so I'm just going to queue up to that part. And again, Eric and I or whomever, we're flawed human beings. The point is not to pick at anyone. It's why you, the viewer, need to do your homework and not just trust the talking head. Okay, so let me play where he does get it right. Uh, at the Council of Constantinople 681, Maximus read uh, Honorius the same way I read Honorius to you at the beginning here, and the same way that John the Fourth read Honorius, namely that when when Honorius said one will, he wasn't talking about the one will between the divine and human natures, but the one will between the mind and the flesh within the human nature alone. Um, and so Maximus defended Honorius. Uh, through and through you can see that defense in his all right so finally eric actually pieces together accurately what maximus defense was what he was teaching was not in christ and though in that clip maybe i was overselling eric getting it right i'm i'm trying to be charitable he was really more just getting right one of the tenets of diatheltism not really the whole thing he he still hasn't said we're talking about two natural wills um divine and um human rather he, he he still doesn't walk back his hypostatic will comment so anyway uh before we fully finish this issue in honorius there's some things along the way which i think are important because it's stuff that people listen to eric they just take him at his word and it's just not historically accurate and it, it pertains to other apologetics so one is eric has a very exacting theory of papal ratification of councils i won't get into every detail but essentially is what you read in the ecumenical council you as a roman catholic can't accept unless you know for a fact a pope ratified that every jot and tittle uh that is in that council and so he takes this point so when there's parts like the end of the fifth council and whatnot 
that he doesn't agree with, he says, well, where's it say a Pope accepted that sentence within the decree of the council? And of course it's hyper skeptical and it's a papacy of the gap sort of argument. It's really, I don't know, it's shooting the arrow and painting the target after the fact, but he does this to build this case to try to shield the papacy from disputes. Um, so here we see amongst these things connected with that idea, the idea that Nicaea II wasn't immediately ratified, right? And this idea that it hinged upon this papal ratification that took almost a century. And so I'm just going to play what Eric has to say about that. Uh, and it takes only about 30 seconds. So one second, because I just don't want people to think this is true because it's not. But here's, here's what Eric has to say. Council of Nicaea, 787. Um, this council was not immediately ratified by Pope uh, Pope Hadrian the first. It's Nicaea too. Um, but and it took a long time. It was eventually ratified, uh, put into the books in the Roman archives, um, in uh, in the year uh, 869. I want to say either 869 or 879. Um, either case, it, it, Rome took a, a long time to finally come around to ratifying the, the council. But all right, and just so people know, that's just not true. Pope, Pope Adrian received the council, then he had it translated, sent to Charlemagne, who said, this is the council, but he complained. He didn't get what he wanted in Bulgaria. Then the Caroline books are written in opposition to the council, and then Pope Adrian defends the council. So how is this that Rome didn't accept this? It's sort of a... It's a very peculiar argument, which I just don't see in the sources. What you see in the sources is that they accepted the council. So if someone could enlighten me on that, I'll happily withdraw the comment. But I'm aware of two letters where he accepted the council, not rejected the council. And I've read the, the scholarly comments on this. They just say because he quibbled about Bulgaria and accept the council. But then why did he have it translated and sent to Charlemagne and then defended after the fact? It, it just doesn't make sense if you know the history. So anyway, we're going to move forward from there. And we got to get into the question is, how about this condemnation of Honorius? Did popes ratify it? Now, Eric is very interested to say, well, did on Leo, Pope Leo II, when he ratified Constable III, affirm that Honorius is a heretic? And he says that essentially, yes, right? You know, Leo II did um say that Honorius is a heretic. I found that to be a very interesting concession. Of course, I agree with it. Um, but that being said, we could see that uh, he also uses this as a way of trying to say, well, all that really matters is if very John Tittle is ratified by a pope and whatever was not ratified in every John Till by a Pope is up for question in the council. Even if Rome has accepted the council, how do we know what details within they've accepted, okay? So we see uh, Eric into a little bit of that here. I'm just gonna cue it up there and then we'll play the clip. All right, and all right, let's share a screen and here we go. Um. So what did Pope Leo II, uh, when, it, when, when Pope Leo II ratified the Council of Constantinople 681, uh, did he accuse Pope Honorius of teaching the monothelite heresy? In other words, did he agree with the council, which I read to you, I showed it on my screen, which accused him of heresy? Uh, did Leo II uh disagree with that so let's see i'm going to share my screen again oh uh, apparently i took out this i didn't play the clip where he tries to quibble about the ratification thing but we'll see what i said before um eric saying that yeah leto second did concede that honoris was a heretic which i find a very interesting concession so let me he reads what um pope leto second says so let's bring that on the screen here we go and in like manner, we anathematize the inventors of the new era, error. That is Theodore, Bishop of Ferran, Sergius, Pyrrhus, Paul, and Peter, betrayers rather than leaders of the Church of Constantinople, and also Honorius, 
who did not attempt to sanctify this apostolic church with the teaching of apostolic tradition, but by profane, but by profane treachery permitted its purity to be polluted. All right, so we see he reads the letter and we can see that the Pope said that the Pope was a heretic. Now, the remainder of the video gets very interesting because it's Eric trying to now argue that the councils really aren't authoritative. And this is a sort of, I hate to use like these kind of slurs, but it's post-traditional. I, I don't think you'd see this in a traditional Catholic. Well, it's a kind of a liberal tact you see in post-traditional Catholic apologetics where the councils reform one another and the councils have these egregious errors. So we see Eric quite candidly say that the fifth council is wrong in condemning people after their death, um, which is something obviously the sixth council did with the Norius is something that the fifth council did the three chapters. That's what the whole three chapters is about. Um, so let's uh, play that clip to show he quite candidly dis disputes what an ecumenical council says. So we have that clip up. Let's go. One sense it's understandable. But I agree with Vigilius's logic in his first constitution, which says that, uh, which appealed to Pope Leo and Pope Galatius, that the keys of the kingdom aren't effective. Uh, it, it, you can't anathematize somebody once they're once they're under the jurisdiction of of God. You know. All right. So Plato says the councils are wrong when they uh, anathematized people after death. Now, that being said. This continues as sort of pulling apart uh, of what the councils teach. And he starts pretty much parsing because not everything essentially is faith and morals, and they're non dogmatic. So if they're non dogmatic, it means it's up for grabs. And it could, you know, even though the whole council hinged upon it, it's an error because it's non dogmatic, which clearly that's how they, they thought when they decreed an ecumenical council, it's what they're doing. Um, so it's a it's a very interesting argument. Let's play Eric in his own words. We'll start with one clip and then another. So let me bring it up. All right, we might start a little early, but it's I don't want to keep clicking around too much. So make sure we're sharing screen. Let's go. The Catholic Encycl Encyclopedia here at the top. You'll see, and I'll for those listening. Oh, the advertisements family, again. Family made money on a company that shipped jobs. To Shipping China. jobs at well, China. We I ain't good. Don't tell me there's two ads. That'd be pretty greedy. When you see things differently, <sighs> you can be the difference. All right. Take a, disable your ads, make a difference. All right, let's go. It makes for bad response for this. In a conversational mode, so uh, it's not going to bore you to death. Um, but uh, I'll start here. Quote, pertinacity. Pertinacity. That is obstinate adhesion to a particular tenant is required to make heresy formal. For as long as one remains willing to submit to the church's decision, he remains a Catholic Christian at heart, and his wrong beliefs are only transient errors and fleeting opinions, close quote. This is the, Catholic, the old Catholic Encyclopedia, volumes, Volume 7. Uh, I have... All right, so as you can see in the first clip... He starts saying, well, um, unless someone persists in the heresy, this comes from uh, Augustine's letter 43, first paragraph, unless someone persists in the heresy, then how will we know they're really a heretic, right? Like, you know, if they didn't, unless you push them real hard, if they didn't keep persisting in it, then they're not really a heretic. You know, they, they could have walked back. They could have been just a slip of the tongue, you know. And so to take Eric, for example. He endorsed the monothelite view at the beginning of his video. Now there's this response video. How does Eric respond to this? Maybe he recants. Well, that shows he's not a formal heretic by his definition, right? Because then he recanted. He didn't, he didn't just keep pursuing obstinately the heresy. But let's say he doesn't, either because he doesn't understand that ignorance or because he's angry at me and he refuses to hear what I have to say, even though I'm quoting the council. You should just listen to the council or it's for the money and he's greedy, like the Oscar's greedy. I'm not saying Eric is, by the way. I'm saying these are different reasons people could do heretical things. No one sets out to be a heretic on purpose. It's either ignorance or greed um, or pride. So based on one of those things, 
if he doesn't recant, then he would be a heretic by one of those measures. And what we see, though, what Eric's trying to craft is you can't condemn people after they're dead, and you can't call an Arius a heretic because we don't know their intent. And without their intent, we don't know if they're formal heretics. But as we just saw, how do we know anyone's intent? We can't see anyone's hearts. All we could say is they're a heretic or not, right? We can't, we don't know Theodore Mopsuesta's intent when he was, you said heretical things. We just know he's a heretic. He said heretical things. With Honorius, we could presume, I think on pretty good grounds, that he was this ecumenist and he was trying to say kumbaya and get the monothelites and the diphthalites on the same page and trying to say, oh no, our positions are the same. But again, that would be either ignorance or greed, right? It's, it's, it's still heresy, but let's say, well, his intent was just to be all kumbaya. He wasn't actually trying to teach something wrong. Well, how do you know his intent? And so by that logic, no one's actually a formal heretic. And if all infallibility is, okay, the Pope's infallible, he can never be a formal heretic, he never could teach formal heresy. In order to teach formal heresy, you have to obstinately teach that heresy without knowing better, all right? When again, like I just told you, almost no, you know, no one knows better. No one sets out to be a heretic on purpose. So if that's the case, then every bishop that's ever been alive is infallible, right? Then the Bishop of Constantinople is infallible because we know no one's intent. That's that's this very basic, I'd say, spiritual life in Christianity. We don't judge the hearts of individuals. Judge not, yes, you be judged. How do we know what's in someone's heart? All we can judge is what they say and do, not their intent. So this this whole like slicing and dicing to make formal heresy versus material heresy, it's just a way to avoid the obvious. If if we're gonna make everything hinge upon that. Papal infallibility is only that they can't be formal heretics, not material heretics. Then all that means is every bishop that's ever alive is, is infallible by that definition because we don't know if anyone's a formal heretic because we don't know anyone's hearts, right? So, of course, why are we even having this conversation? Why do we even have that doctrine? It's silly. And it just shows the circular logic inherent in the Roman epistemology, which is highly problematic. But I think that lays bare exactly what it is. Now, that being said, let's play the next clip from Eric on this point. Let me share a screen again, and we'll get started. Can, um, can, can you prove somebody's a formal heretic when they're already deceased? And in my view, you can't, which is why the church doesn't do this anymore. Okay. So the church today would not stand behind the action of the Council of Constantinople 553 with regard to Theodore of Mopsuestia, and it also would not stand behind the execution of the judgment of Pope Honorius um, by the Council of Constantinople 681, because these are not dogmatic facts, and there's a lack of a jur juridical process. Uh, all right, so you see it right, you see exactly what I said right there. And this whole idea, well, when Vigilius then recanted that you can't condemn people after death and you could now condemn people after death, well, that's just non-dogmatic. Well, why? He he thought and everyone thought that was a matter of dogma, then why were they quoting Augustine and everyone else on the issue? Well, we're just going to arbitrarily say it's non-dogmatic. So if you give me the same you know, charity and say, all right, I get to decide what's non-dogmatic for me, then I can make every bishop infallible because they're just saying non-dogmatic statements. So obviously that's silly. The other issue is where he says, well, that they didn't have the, the jurisdiction to even do it. So like the right procedure wasn't followed and condemning someone after they were dead. But we have Canon 81, the Council of Carthage. We have that that is of ecumenical authority because the Council of Trula, which by the way, Rome, all, Rome did accept in Canon 1 of Nicaea 2, which you accept, read Canon 1, and you know you accept the Trulo. I hate the bursty bubble. And the first Canon of Trulo condemns Honorius as a heretic. It says he taught heresy. That's in the first Canon of Trulo. Canon 81 of Carthage, which is made ecumenical by Canon 2 of Trulo, says that people could be condemned after their death. So this is a matter of canon. It's dogmatic. This, this, they had a whole council on this issue in the fifth council. We had a whole two additional ecumenical councils condemn people after they're dead, the sixth and the seventh. So 
this is a settled issue. And by saying it's not a settled issue, it shows we're walking back to councils and saying they're in error because we don't like what they say. That's all this is. Let's just say, say it for what it is. All right. And of course, sadly, post-traditional Catholic apologetics don't like the councils because it disproves their premises. But the history of the church, they wouldn't te treat councils that way. In fact, the first person that I could find in church history that has is Anastasius, the librarian himself, which I'll have to do a future video or article on this. He's literally the inventor of modern Roman Catholic heresy. It's, it's that one man. He literally introduced the forgeries and, and reinvented the ecclesiastical institution, the papacy. He, he reinvented how we deal with specifically the ecumenical councils. He, po he misquotes Pope St. Gregory the Great on it. It's Anastasius is just, you got to know the figure, but he's just so wrong and he's not even a Catholic saint. Um, so that's kind of concerning that this guy is the first guy to say all this stuff that differentiates between the Orthodox and yourselves. We don't have the time to get into Anastasius in much more detail today. We'll get in a little bit. But this argument that formal heretics must have proven intent, which is impossible when someone's condemned to their death, seems to be a response to my Vigilius article, because I, I point this out. And I just have to say, well, how do we know who's right? Is Eric right or am I right? And maybe you shouldn't trust any talking head. You just have to do your research. But I'm going to say, I think if we're just going to talk like historians and not look for epistemic certainty, what's in the hearts of men, because by that logic, no no person's a heretic formally, right? We already said we don't know what's in any man's heart. But we're going to just be like reasonable and go, all right, was Honoris obstinate in pursuing monotheltism? I'm going to answer yes. Here's my proof. There's only one piece of evidence that exists in church history that states whether or not Rome accepted the ecthesis, which was the Council of Constantinople 6, 638, specifically on the question of monotheltism. It's in the Syriac life of Maximus. It's translated by Sebastian Brock. It's on page 317. All right. So this is our only source. So if we're going to go by history, this is all we have to go by. What does the source say? The emperor at once made a document called an edict. That's the ecthesis. And sent it to the four patriarchal sees. So, you know, that's Antioch's the one that's missing. They didn't have a bishop at the time because of the Muslim invasion. When this order from the emperor arrived and was received by the four sees and all the bishops, they added the signatures of their agreement. All right. So based on our only extant evidence, Rome accepted the ecthesis. And that makes sense being that the person who wrote the ecthesis of Heraclius received a monothelite letter to him from the Pope, right? So it makes sense they would have accepted it. So Honorius did not make a sloppy statement in passing. He can't just blame his scribe or something. He accepted a heretical counsel. That was two, well, after that, after the his letter, that's five years. That was five years later, four or five years later. So that's obstinate if we're going to speak historically. All right, so am I going to know what's going on in his heart? No, but this meets the criteria of obstinance in pursuing a heresy and not recanting it over time. And so that literally just undoes everything Eric said. And of course, they're going to say, well, we don't like that source. A monothelite wrote it, whatever, whatever, whatever. I understand, but that's the only source we have. It's the only one that exists. So if you don't like it, it's just like, all right, you don't like that. I don't know. We've got ancient cuneiform and that the ancient Sumerians existed. If that's all we have, that's all we have to go by. It doesn't matter what you like. So that's what our only extant source on what happens with the acceptance of ecthesis says. Okay. Um, we do find, by the way, if you read Latin 649, where it quotes the ecthesis, it does it, it eternally speaks of everyone accepting it. So that's just consistent, by the way, with the uh with the Syriac life of St. Maximus. Now I'm not going to play the clip because it would be take too much time. But Eric then gets it to Anastasius, librarian's excuses for Honorius, these varying excuses. Um, and I think, again, like I said previously, because they're fundamentally different, it reveals that he had different categories of thought than Eric did. Because we never see Anastasius, librarian, for example, saying, well, what Honorius said was actually correct. For example, um, what we we don't see it, we don't what we don't see him saying is the formal material heresy 
um, differentiation. Um, rather, what does he say? So, for example, he says that um, Honorius did not really write the monothelite statements, right? He, he quotes, he cites Maximus since Opusculum 20, actually, my apologies, that John the Counselor wrote them. Um, and according, I'm going to quote Anastasius in seventh century popes and martyrs, page 153. He says that, well, maybe uh, John the Counselor entered these statements out of hatred of the Pope, hatred towards the Pope, he says. So he's saying, well, maybe the scribe hated the Pope and made him look like a heretic. Well, we know that's not true because Rome went soon afterwards, accepted the ecthesis. Now, the other excuse he gives is John the Counselor may have not uh, made enough, I'm going to quote Anastasius, attempts to correct him, Honorius, or argue back, thereby testing how devoted to the arguments Honorius was so that we should give the benefit of doubt to Honorius. It's actually kind of cute. Um, Anastasius then goes, quotes, the gospel, judge not, yes, he be judged. But it's like, all right, well, how do we know that John the Counselor, when writing this, didn't say, are you sure you want to say this, Pope? And unless he said, are you sure, you're really, really sure, then he wasn't obstinate, right? So we see this kind of tortures argument trying to apply Augustine's letter 43, paragraph one from Anastasius. But the problem with this is he was obstinate because, again, the Syriac minutes of uh, the Syriac uh, life of Maximus, which speaks about what happens to the ecthesis. And because Anastasius didn't read Syriac, he had no idea this occurred. Now, I think that pretty much between John IV changing excuses and Maximus changing, ex you know, with another excuse, well, it's John's fault, so Anastasius saying, well, how do we know John really questioned him enough? These varying excuses uh, from the, the these guys, and forgive me also from St. Maximus, who, uh, just so you know, when you read St. Photius, he says in polemics, sometimes the saints say extreme things that aren't strictly accurate. Well, this would be one of those examples why do they keep giving different polemical excuses? Because none of them hold water. That's the first, because Honorius really is a heretic. That's why there's not one defense for Honorius. It's because he is a heretic. You got to keep digging up excuses to clear his name. Now, um, Eric then, and guys, you can start asking questions because we're going to be over really soon. And I'll make a little time for um, questions. So let's see. How could I do this? Da -da -da -da, I got to. This is really bad, me and technology, that is. Maybe the stream, too. I'm sorry if it is for you. But all right, if you have questions, you could ask them now, and uh, I will get to them in a second. But um, that being said, let's play a couple more clips from Eric, and where he speaks of Eastern Orthodoxy's treatment of Honorius. And he tries to say, oh, well, you Eastern Orthodox, I'm going to now uh, show that if you may think he's a heretic, you're eviscerating yourselves on these other issues. So let's see if that holds water. So let, let's go to that clip. One second. Those letter was accepted by the Council of 681. And in that letter, Pope... Act oh, no, the advertisement. Sales teams have it tough. The pressure to hit their numbers keeps rising. Agatho says that Christ the Lord established the infallibility of the seat of Peter in Rome until the end of time. All right. And he quote Agatho that says he established infallibility from the end of time. All right, let's see. I'm gonna put that Constable three. Um, infallibility to the end of time. I mean, I mean, but it's got a really bad memory. And you know, guess what? You'll get to see me if you can. I don't remember infallibility to the end of time. That sounds like Eric's words. Infall hmm. The word infallibility doesn't ap appear once in Agatha's letter. Big surprise. All right, that's Eric's interpretation. Well, what if your interpretation on how anyone else at that time interpreted it? Um, there will be a debate between Alan Rule and I on Lateran 649, because people like quoting Lateran 649 as saying all these uh, um, things that show that there was papal supremacy. But what if I could demonstrate, yeah, we got words that sound like that, but what they did and what they say elsewhere shows that's not what those words mean. Hmm, that changes a lot of stuff now, does it? Just like with my debate, uh, Dr. Lucatus on ICA2. But anyway, let's continue Eric's statement. 
he made it certain by his promise given to St. Peter that his faith would not fail. So if we're going to be real sticklers about every word and letter of an ecumenical council being true and infallible and God-breathed and not subject. Again, Orthodox don't believe they're, it's God-breathed. The scriptures are God-breathed. They believe the councils are superintended by God. You can read this in Apostolic Canon 85's commentary and St. Nicodemus the Rudder. To revision. Then it seems to me you're going to have to accept the infallibility of the apostolic see of Rome until the end. No, because that statement is not in Agatha's letter. And why are you quoting a statement not in this letter at verbatim the second time? That's not in his letter. Um, so bizarre. All right. So we we have that there. So that being said, we have 134.50-58 where he makes the argument, well, what do you do with uh, – all these saints teaching the filioque, right? And you're like, that has to do with anything. So I just want to uh, bring that up. And I recommend everyone to watch my uh, interview in uh, The Meaning Catholic with um, Timothy Flanders. I, I think I give a good defense of Augustine not teaching the double procession doctrine, the filioque. But all right, let's see what Eric has to say. Filioque very clearly. And so there are far more heretics than Honorius was. And it's not just Augustine, Leo, and Hillary. There's countless saints in the Orthodox calendar who teach the filioque. All right. And I will end that there because this is where, like I said, you can't go by talking heads. Okay. Because if we actually go over, like uh, I have a whole video of Father Patrick on St. Hillary, and I have videos on St. Augustine and uh, the issue of the filioque, and I'll have more in my upcoming documentary, Errors the Catholics. Again, if you donate $50 or more and you put in the notes uh, to be a producer of the film, you will be listed as one of the producers of that upcoming documentary. Every penny is matched uh, for the churches in Cambodia. So you'll be actually supporting the churches in Cambodia by supporting the film. Now, the point is, it's without dispute that St. Cyril of Alexandria, St. Augustine, they literally contradict St. Maximus, by the way, by the way, also Anastasius the librarian. They literally contradict the double procession doctrine of the filioque, which is dogmatized in Florence. And what I've been seeing are these really pitiful arguments that Florence wasn't dogmatizing double procession doctrine, even though they were literally contradicting the letter of Marinus from Maximus. And we know from one of the attendants of Florence was put forward three times as a reunion formula. All right, so they're saying, well, we just think the Greek side was lying that they're putting up Maximus three times through union formula. Then why put in session six of Florence something that explicitly contradicts what Maximus wrote? It's not like the words are random. Like it explicitly contradicts what the letter of Marinus says because they were going by the Thomistic doctrine of the Philicry, which is double procession. That's what's dogmatized in the Roman Catholic Church. So that being said, when, when you the talking heads are fast and loose, you get a lot of misinformation like that. And all of it is false from the beginning where Eric defended monothelitism and said that, that that's what he actually believed and that's what Pope Honorius was defending. To the very end, we see lots and lots of errors. The question is whether Eric will be obstinate, right? That will, by his definition, determine whether he's a formal heretic or what we just heard was material heresy, all right? But at the end of the day, we don't know whether it's ignorance, whether it's on purpose, he just wants to trick you. Uh, out of pride or or whatever we we don't know the intent of his heart that's not the point we can only say what's heretical what's not okay so that would be um my comments on that i'm just gonna you guys write questions and i'm just gonna make a very brief comment i don't do these very often my two cents so let me tell you my two cents on a topic and it's on alphabet soup now I think a lot of people react with hatred of people in the, I don't want to call people that have the sexual proclivities that are moral um, a community because I don't consider adulterers a community. I'll consider fornicators a community. I don't consider those who have extramarital uh, sex and like before marriage, for example, I don't consider that a community. I don't consider sodomy a community. These are all the sinful actions according to a Christian doctor. 
right? And so because these are all just sinful actions, no one is a community. And that doesn't justify than hating someone who's guilty of doing a sin more than you are. Because Christ says, let those without sin cast the first stone, right? So it's not about hating a community. I mean, there's an agenda around these sins because Satan always has an agenda. But we don't hate people. So that, that is something that's very important. We can't hate the person. These are people struggling with things, especially when it's adults that have made the decision. They call it these days transitioning. You know, well, they're adults. They made their own informed decision, just like heretics make their own informed decision. We all work based upon varying levels of information, obviously, and with different intent. And they make these decisions. They're not all good ones, just like you and I have always not made good decisions, dear audience. And at that point, what we could condemn is a decision or a lifestyle, but not the person. And just because that person makes a decision you don't like, it doesn't mean you can't work with that person because you couldn't work with anyone. You couldn't be like, it doesn't mean you leave the world, right? As uh, St. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 6, when he deals with sexual morality in the church, he says, when I said to have nothing to do with the sexually immoral, I wasn't talking about those in the world, talking about those in the church, or you couldn't be in the world, St. Paul says. Right? And so our discernment and our condemnation should be of acts that are not being repented of in the church, not those outside the church. We ought to be evangelizing those outside the church so that they may repent. And otherwise, we should um, be a peace of all men as much as possible, as the scriptures say. Right. So that way, have no issue if you don't like the beliefs of your employer or for your coworkers or whatever. That's fine because they might be worse in that category by Christian standards, but you could be worse by, the, by other Christian standards or even their standards in another category. So we have to have humility about that. My last point and my last of my cent and my two cents is I am concerned for the young particularly the really young, you know, 12, 13-year-olds and whatnot. And the reason I'm concerned for the young is because everyone remembers when they first go to middle school, they, they find their coolest shirt in their drawer, and they find their coolest set of pants and their coolest shoes, and they try to be someone they weren't because middle school is the opportunity to be, to be the cooler version of you that you couldn't quite accomplish in fifth or sixth grade, depending when you go to middle school, right? And so why do kids at that precocious age do that because they want a sense of belonging. And I think, and I'm speaking from a friend who has a, a child who identifies as transgender and loves his child, okay, that he believes the big motivation is people looking for a sense of belonging and community. Remember what I said before, that all these things aren't communities. They're just decisions we make. We've turned decisions into communities. But people are opting to decisions thinking they're getting a community because they're lacking something. They're lacking support. They're lacking love. They're lacking understanding. Um, sometimes, let's say, if you're really, I don't know, feeling like you can't be a cool guy, you might be like, well, then maybe I ought to be a cool something else so I can at least be cool at something. Um, I think also another issue is a lot of people grew up, I mean, they never had to deal with a screech on a chalkboard, right? That's the oppression that us millennials grew up with, you know? And so when you grow up without difficulties, people will search for these difficulties. They search to be oppressed, <laughs> you know? Um, it, it's interesting because, for example, my wife is a ethnic minority, and I've seen her get the short end of the stick because she's an ethnic minority. And that's not good and it doesn't make me happy. But thank God it's like not that there's institutional discrimination against her unless she were to apply for college, right? Because there is institutional discrimination against Asians if they apply for college. But otherwise, it's like, you know, if she buys a house, there's not institutional discrimination. Um, there's no one lynching Southeast Asians. Um, you know, and people overplay, like in New York City, there's a lot of violence, particularly between blacks and Asians. It's blacks generally hurting Asians. But I don't even think these, you know, are strictly 
uh, hate crimes. It's just people trying to get people's money and they're going after people they think they aren't going to fight back. You know, so this is something where, yes, there's racism, but it's it's not like what people had to go through in the 50s and 60s where they're shot with fire hoses that they weren't allowed to go to the same school. And it wasn't because they just lived in a poor town. They were they could be in a great town and they were not allowed in the same school, right? This isn't slavery where if you're born the wrong race, you are born in bondage, right? You know, that that's truly horrific racism. You know, the racism we have today is not good, really profoundly horrific, like the racism that killed people, okay? And in the rare instances where racism does kill people, like when... Um, there was a black guy that mowed down a bunch of white people. Um, I think there's been white people that, yeah, there's white people that shoot black churches. There's black people that shoot black churches. You know, when stuff like that happens, it's awful. But thank God, it's not, a, it's like after the Holocaust, doing it at that level has stopped. Like the human race is like, oh, I guess we took it that far that time. We should kind of stop doing it so obviously. And so we've made strides since then as a human species, thankfully. So, my point in saying this is that because people want to feel like there's some sort of historical continuity, that they're fighting the man, that they're part of something. That they're joining these communities. Man, did YouTube just censor me? I'm joking. So otherwise they couldn't identify as oppressed unless they opted into a totally voluntary lifestyle. And that makes them feel like they're part of something. And I think what we ought to be a part of is part of the body of Christ. The lifestyle we ought to be opting into is the lifestyle of Christ, the repenting of sin, all right? We don't know what's in the hearts. We cannot judge them. And so I think there's an identity crisis. And I think maybe if you think of the alphabet soup issue as an issue of an identity crisis, you may, with more compassion, look at these people, be understanding, and think of maybe where you feel like you don't fit in, maybe where you are having crisis. And that should make you more understanding. All right, so now that you have my two cents, let's go over some of these questions. Um, we have this. I saw Pratt engage with Eric once at the usage of Peter's faith not failing, saying that the reason Roman canon law interpreted not as meaning the fallibility. That Roman canon law interpreted not. Is that what you're referring to? I'm not sure. Silvardis, I'm not um, I'm not sure what you're slicing and dicing at. So if you want to clarify, maybe we could uh, we talk about talk about that. For this random question, I don't know why my nose is so itchy. What thoughts do you have about the river Euphrates drying up in the Bible, Revelation 16, 12? Um, very specifically, I think the river Jordan, the river Euphrates is always like this typology of the separation between the promised land and the dominion of Satan. Right. And the river is like this defensive barrier, meaning it's like what we see in Romans one, that God, it says that God hands people over to the sinfulness in their own heart. So God, like uh, Job, puts a hedge around us. It prevents us from having worse, uh, worse sins in our lives, worse demonic temptations. And so when that river dries up, when that hedge is removed, then like Job, we have the full onslaught of Satan, of temptations, of physical ailments, all the things that come from the devil. So that's exactly what Revelation 16, 12 is about. Um, sorry to disappoint people because they're all looking for Chinese armies and stuff, um, but that's really what it's about. Now, uh, we have no other questions, and so this is your last opportunity. I'm going to plug the churches of Cambodia. Has this blessed you? Are you now going to reconsider your monothelite uh, heresy? Well, great. You could bless the, not the Patreon of some guy, not buying some book from someone that doesn't do their research. But rather, you could bless the churches of Cambodia because it has nothing to do with Ramashmak. You could just help preach the gospel in Cambodia by going to orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. Um, the link is below. 
Every single penny goes to support the Church of Cambodia. Um, please commit the $5 a month or $10 a month. Please commit because many hands makes like work and we are the only means of support they have right now. Latest news is uh, now that uh, COVID's kind of withdrawing or people is getting used to living in it, they're going to be restarting the liturgies in Simriap. That's in the third Cambodian city. We need more money because we got to rent a house. Quite frankly, if you donate $200, you are the reason why that month there's two liturgies in, a, in another Cambodian city. So consider being making a big difference in the history of the world by helping evangelize in Cambodia. Again, you could do that at orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. You could also pray for me, um, pray for Eric. Uh, but again, giving alms is an opportunity to be blessed by God. It's one of the ways that we draw closer to God. So. Um, that is my plug for orthodoxchristianthology.com slash donate. So I'll just end it here. I'll give my personal apologies to Eric. None of this here is actually meant to offend him. It's just that the problem is you got these guys like us, these talking heads who are not experts. Quite frankly, the bishops are saying all such things that are a mess these days, and both are communions. The scholars say things, all sorts of things that are a mess these days. And there's so much confusion. And it's getting so bad that people that are dependable are saying, yeah, monothelitism, diatheletism, they're the same thing. And we have someone say, oh, Pope Honorius, he, he wasn't a monothelite heretic, you know, and because he taught this, and this is orthodox. But what Eric just said was textbook monothelitism. And it's because people are not reading the councils. If I could have any moral of the story is that's why you can't skip the councils and read the scholars. You can't just skip for the canons and the decrees. You got to do the ugly, dirty work of reading the minutes, minute by minute, because that's the only way you're really going to know what they're talking about is reading these councils minute by minute. All right. I got a show on Sunday on Nicaea 2 um, with uh, probably the best Protestant uh, I've heard on this issue. It's going to get into textual criticism and other things around icons on Nicaea 2. Tune on Sunday. And otherwise, I'll end the show as I end all of them by quoting Jesus Rock. Fight to death for the truth, and the Lord God will fight for you. God bless you. Have a great day.